thank you very much. Well, I'm very honoured to have been invited to give the inaugural lecture. I think when I was invited, I wasn't actually told I was inaugurating this, so um, it's slightly daunting. And I should say, I'm not going to be talking about my own research at all, so if you came wanting to know about physics at the interface with biology, you can leave now, because that's not what I'm talking about. Um, but I am going to talk about the sort of concept of interdisciplinarity, if you like, and why I think it's dangerous, and all the many other kinds of divides that our society puts upon us. And some of that will undoubtedly be around gender, because that is something that's very close to my heart. So there are many kinds of binary divides in our society and in our academic life. And I think just about all of them are fairly pernicious. So let me start off with a fairly obvious one of male, female. Um, why do I think that's not such a good idea? Well, are we really so different? Um, do I have talents that the men don't have? Uh, do you want to put me on some normalized diagram? I think that's a very dangerous thing. And of course, these days, we talk much more about gender fluidity or people who don't even want to identify as binary. So um, it's getting more and more dangerous, I think, to talk about this simply as male, female, although it's easy shorthand. Um, but then there's arts versus science. Uh, that's been around for really quite a long time and I think is also dangerous. Um, and interdisciplinarity is obviously part of the challenge. I mean, my, my particular research, physics and biology, is all within science. But then um, when I was the university's gender equality champion, I found myself reading far more social, social science papers um, than physics. Uh, so, you know, I crossed over into a different area, if you like. Um, and then there are people who are just genuinely good at an awful lot of things. Why should they be pigeonholed into one side or other of that divide? And um, crossing disciplines, as I hope I'll show you, is really important um, in the current age. We, we're not only going to need people who can focus in one tiny area if we're going to solve the societal challenges we face. Um, then there's the color of skin. Uh, black versus white is the usual way of expressing it. I am not entirely sure that uh, black is currently a, a politically correct term, but um, in terms of that binary divide, it's the obvious way of expressing it. If I put person of color versus white, it would feel a little odd. Um, but many people, um, we were doing some statistics in my college trying to look at the, the um, composition of our student body, and it turned out that of the non-white students, mixed race was actually the largest single group. So we have to be careful when we start dividing people up in that way. Um, and finally, pink, blue, I do get fed up with pinkification of society. If you have a small child, you are probably only too familiar with the dangers of pink, blue. Um, and I think that actually that impacts very severely on the way we bring up our children. I mean, it's not just pink, blue, it's the kind of toys we give and all the rest of it. And again, I will come on and give you some examples of that later on. So that's sort of the broad scope, the kind of divides that I want to abolish, if you like, um, and try and say people are people and we should treat them as people and not try and pigeonhole them in one way or another. So we all know what scientists look like, don't we? Uh, they wear white lab coats and they have sticking up hair. Um, they're probably quite old um, and they're usually male. And that's a pretty bad approximation. Well, it's certainly a pretty bad approximation to me on several fronts. Um, the last time I had a white lab coat on was unfortunately when I was being photographed for some magazine article. You try and say, no, I don't wear a white lab coat, but no, 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 you have to wear a white lab coat. Um, and we know how they work too. If you can't read the small print underneath that says, quiet, he's right, I have another think coming. There's sort of mystique about the scientist that is, um, again, fairly pernicious. And I, I think those two kind of images feed into uh, some of the problems about scientists are a race apart. If you are a, um, a linguist, say, somehow science is over there. And that, I think, is terribly unhelpful. So, um, why is it suddenly said touch here for full screen? On, on that screen, it says touch here for full screen, but as it doesn't project, we'll ignore that. So what do scientists really look like? Well, think, think of some scientists you've come across. Um, that's a typical one, Martin Rees, former president of the Royal Society, astronomer royal. Um, that's a, a familiar person in our newspapers commenting on different things and currently very involved in Cambridge, actually, with the Center for Existential Risk. So he has um, certainly gone interdisciplinary from his background in astronomer. 
astronomy. Paul Nurse, who was the, the next president of the Royal Society, um, Nobel Prize winner. Uh, I'm not going to remember what, what he got the Nobel Prize for, but it was biology. Um, and currently running the Crick Institute in London. Um, and Brian Cox, familiar from our TV screens, a high energy physicist. Three examples of your average white man. That's typically what people think scientists look like. But um, that's the current president of the Royal Society, Venki Ramakrishna, always known as Venki. Um, he doesn't quite fit the same bill. He, he's um, Indian origin, spent a long time in the States, and has been in Cambridge uh, at the Laboratory for Molecular Biology for many years now. I'm going to fall over this. Um, they're all male, so can you name a woman scientist? There was a, a study done to um, find out what the public knew. You should always ask the public, what do they know about um, female scientists? And two thirds of them couldn't name a single famous female scientist. Um, the Royal Society did a study and showed that 90% of 18 to 24 year olds could not name a female scientific figure, uh, and that included their science teacher. I mean, actually, if you go a bit younger, that's probably more relevant. If you ask a 15 year old and they've got a female science teacher, they won't even think of her as a scientist. Um, most people, well, over half, no, no, sorry, under half, could name a male scientist like Albert Einstein, he of sticking up hair. Um, but there are some female scientists, honest. So that's the one that most people come up with, Marie Curie. Uh, that's Rosalind Franklin, whose uh, name is much more in sort of common parlance these days than it was when I was growing up. Um, unfortunately, usually as a woman who didn't get the, the Nobel Prize, unless you think that's John Jocelyn Bell Burnell. So, um, she, she has a slightly mixed praise. I may say Churchill, just by way of being interdisciplinary, let me stick this in. So Churchill was founded as a college um, that was by statute 70% science. Um, so we have a large number of science and engineering students, but we also have the most fantastic archives. We have the Churchill papers there, and we have Rosalind Franklin's papers there. So, you know, we have a bit of everything in Churchill. We are suitably interdisciplinary. Um, that's Susan Greenfield, not so much in the news as she was a few years back. Um, she was in the news sometimes for the wrong reasons, for having spent a lot of money doing up the Royal Institution in London. Um, and also, I'm afraid for often being posed sitting on a, a table in a miniskirt, which didn't seem to me a, a, the right pose for a scientist, female scientist, to the extent that when I was interviewed for The Guardian some years back, I said, you dare mention my length of my skirt. <laughs> and they didn't. They didn't. I suspect I was in trousers anyhow. Um, and that is Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who, as I say, is the, the other woman who didn't win the Nobel Prize, as it were. Marie Curie did win the Nobel Prize twice, so we should celebrate that. So there are some uh, suitable examples of famous female women scientists, but again, they're all white. Um, so um, some of you may have seen this film, Hidden Figures. I must confess I haven't. This is a, a, a glossy from the film, which was about um, a group of black women who um, worked on the NASA uh, rocket mission. Um, so. There were three scientists there who, who sort of were formed the focus of the story. The, these are photographs of the, the, the real women as opposed to the film stars. Um, these were Catherine Gabelt, Mary Jackson, and Catherine Vaughan. And they made an enormous difference to the NASA mission, but it sort of got written out of history. And I think Hidden Figures, which was a book and then a film, I think has been very interesting in sort of reminding people that um, such people existed way back, and still do. Recently, there was a study, um, it was an international uh, sort of survey asking quite young children, primary school children, to, to draw a scientist. And it was remarked that compared with when this was done previously, more primary children do draw a female scientist these days. Um, and that's an example. Uh, I, I think it's a female scientist by the length of her hair. Obviously, this newspaper article thought it was a female scientist. But still, I suspect, with a test tube of rather nasty looking green fluid, I'm wearing a lab coat. But nevertheless, perhaps it's progress. So, the kinds of issues I want to talk about goes back to my title about labels and assumptions and stereotypes and the fact that these things then drive the children as they grow up into 
constrained circumstances. It may restrict their choices because they feel affected by these sort of cultural images that they come across. And I think we should ask some questions. I'm not going to attempt to answer all of these during this lecture, but do I do my science differently because I'm a woman? Do I do my science differently in an intellectual sense or in the way I lead my research group? Or is it totally irrelevant that I'm a woman? And you know, I can ask that question about myself, uh, and the answers for me might not be the same as the answers uh, for another woman, but I certainly don't think it's inherently the case that as a woman, I do my science this way, and the man in the next door lab does his science in a different way. I think that's just rubbish. Um, do we need women doing science? Is there any point in worrying about this? And I hope I'll give you some examples of why diversity really does matter in research. Increasingly, people talk in business about diverse teams, diverse management teams lead to better outcomes for the company. And I would say that's almost certainly true for research too. And then there's the question about, am I different from a scholar, in inverted commas, which seems to be someone who is on the outside? Um, I took the exception to Stefan Collini's book where he constantly referred to scientists and scholars as if we were alien beings. And I actually wrote a blog post about this, uh, whereupon Stefan Collini, who I'd never met at that point, um, but is in Cambridge, uh, sent me a four-page rebuttal. Um, and, and in it he said, He's a fellow of Trinity, as is Martin Rees. And he said, I discuss this all the time with Martin Rees, and he didn't mind. Um, and I, I wrote back and said, well, maybe if you'd approached it gradually and explained why you were cutting us up into these two sections, I would have felt better. But it was just black-white again. It was this clear distinction all the way through the book. So I wasn't very convinced by his rebuttal. Um, as a scientist, as a physicist, what should I be capable of reading? And should historians be able to grasp the kinds of things that I might read, um, in which could have statistics in it, graphs, um, equations? Do we carve ourselves up far too soon in our schooling? And if you cross disciplinary boundaries, what does that do for your career, um, your research, and the way people perceive you? And then finally, back to what do we instill in our children about labels and stereotypes in schools? Because to some extent, all of you in the audience You've made your decisions. I worry about our young children and how we are conditioning them to follow in the same mold as generation after generation of men on this side, women on that side, science on one side, arts on the other side. And you may note I did men and science, women and arts, which is one of those pernicious things. And this question, should we talk about women scientists? And even worse, lady scientists. I do get very allergic to the word lady. Um, so at one point, BuzzFeed approached me for some quote about what I felt being a, a lady boss. And um, yeah, I probably can't. So at the top, the quote from the, the journalist was, new on BuzzFeed, 21 tips for, for slaying at work from the lady bosses. And, and this was my reply. Um, I'm not very impressed by being called a lady boss. Um, it's grammatically wrong, apart from anything else. Um, it took me a long time to work that out. That, that was one of the reasons I hated it. But there are other reasons, too. And it probably also comes back to, that's no lady, that's my wife joke, which probably isn't current now, but I was certainly brought up on it. I mean, I heard it when I was a child. It wasn't the way we, we talked at home. So let's start with gender issues. And I'll come on to the more explicitly interdisciplinary issues later. Why does diversity in science and engineering matter? I'm often told, why does it matter if girls don't want to do physics? Um, well, there's the part of maybe they do want to do some, uh, physics or other sciences, but their teachers say you can't. But I, I think there is a much more fundamental reason about getting good outcomes. So in the UK at the moment, it is well known, well accepted, we have a productivity problem. Um, compared with our European neighbors, I'm not going into Brexit, don't worry. Compared with our European neighbors, we are very unproductive. Um, and if we look at engineering, engineering is overwhelmingly male. 9% uh, of the engineering workforce is female. That's a pathetic figure. 6% uh, of registered engineers and technicians who belong to, there are something like 31 different engineering institutions, but 6% of registered engineers are women. That figure is much lower than in any other country. Um, 
So in, in some of the um, new accession states in the EU, Latvia, Bulgaria, no, sorry, I don't think, Actually, I can't remember if Latvia, Bulgaria, and Cyprus are in the EU, which is embarrassing. So, scrub that. Some of the um, Eastern European countries, let's say, um, have much higher figures of women in engineering. Um, if you look at engineering as an undergraduate subject, the numbers are slightly higher. It's about 16%, and the numbers are slowly drifting up, but it's still a very dismal proportion. Um, and it isn't changing rapidly at all, despite many interventions. Um, apprentices are even more dismal. So that's not a particularly recent figure. But at that point, 2013-14, 3.8% of engineering apprentices were women. And underpinning all of that is the fact that at A-level, we have very few girls uh, doing physics A-level. Uh, again, that number has not changed. The Institute of Physics put out a report yesterday, uh, which I was reading on the train coming up, and it's reflecting on what has happened since the report it published in 2012, and really the answer is not much. Um, a lot of work is going into the, the schools. The schools are only part of the problem. It's all our culture which says to young girls, physics is probably not for you. And other countries don't have this problem. I do not believe it's genetic. I get really frustrated when I'm told, well, maybe girls don't like physics, because why is it different in India or Bulgaria? Um, and why is it if you go to a single sex school, you are much more likely to study physics at A-level than if you go to a mixed school? I do not believe it's down to genetics or our hormones or whatever you want. So this is a, an Instagram from, um, I think one of the engineering, or maybe it's WISE, the Women in Science and Engineering um, organization. And I just want you to focus on that central panel. If we're going to increase our productivity, we need more engineers. I can't remember the figures, but we're hundreds of thousands short of people in many of the relevant discipline. And yet, if we start off with 1,000 11-year-olds, um, if we take 100 boys and 100 girls, not quite those numbers there, um, who go on to do physics at GCSE and get an A, to a star to C, then only 13 girls will go on to study physics out of that bunch. And going on and doing an engineering or technology degree, there will only be, I can't read that, three females. So we are losing them at every stage. And yet, we are desperately short of people trained in these disciplines. And it's only going to get worse. I mean, you were talking about um, big data. So people who are skilled in these kind of topics, we're going to need more and more of them. And we are throwing away half the population, in essence, by not facilitating them going on. So we have something of a problem there. And if you look at um, innovation, the kinds of things that might lead to, to new inventions, women are less likely to seek external finance. So these are the ones who are sort of keeping going. Um, men are three times more likely to own their own businesses. And the number of patents going to women is tiny. So again, that is saying we are wasting a lot of talent. But why does it matter? I still haven't, in one sense, told you why it matters in terms of the research outcomes. I've said it matters because we're not training enough people for our society. But it also matters because of the, the fact that if you have a lot of people who are all very similar trying to solve a problem, they will all tend to solve the problem in the same way. So this is an example. Um, Gendered Innovations is a site that's run out of Stanford um, and has looked at a whole range of examples of where things went wrong, if you like, because of taking a, a monocular view of things. So this first example is about the standard crash test dummy, which was designed originally for many, many years. All the tests on the safety of cars was done on an American male at the 50th percentile of the population of males. So you can imagine a child doesn't really fit that very well. And pregnant women don't fit that very well. Women themselves don't fit it very well, but pregnant women even more so. And it is immensely dangerous. If you construct something that is safe for one kind of person and you then have a pregnant woman, how the seatbelt fits is really a problem. And the evidence is um, that 
it led to a lot of fetal deaths because in impact, the seatbelt was entirely badly designed. Um, so you need a team that is going to think we are not all the 50th percentile male um, in order to come up with something that is suitable for a wide range of different people. So that's one example. The other one I'll give, um, which I sort of feel is quite close to home, is the difference in how heart attacks present in men and women. And the evidence is that um, men present heart attacks, they often have pain in one arm, I assume the left arm. Um, but women don't present the heart attacks in the same way. I have no idea why. But um, a lot of women were being turned away from A&E when they were actually having a heart attack because it, it wasn't in the textbooks that that's how a heart attack manifests itself. So again, it's really important that people think that we are not all identical. And um, so, it's the, the, the sort of the whole way a heart attack appears in men and women is somewhat different, and the treatments may be different too, and the diagnostic tests may need to be different. So there are lots of examples around those sort of health issues. There's another area where I haven't got um, a slide, but any biologists in the audience, if you work with cells, um, and I've worked with cell lines, and I have no idea if the cell lines came from a male or a female in, you know, decades ago kind of thing. And, and yet again, it turns out that there are certain ways in which male cells and female cells are different. And I don't just mean the obvious ones in the sort of, um, uh, sort of <laughs> sexual cells, as it were, but just across the body. Um, and so, it's becoming the norm, but it's taken a long time for research and journals and things to demand that you specify the, the gender of your cell so that you know if you're comparing like with like. Now, I, I think of this as male by default. Some years ago, the gender equality champion in Cambridge, I took exception to the way committees were listed in the official um, organ of the university, something called the reporter. So you'd list a committee. And um, by this point, the university was very conscious we need women on our committee. Um, and so if they had a list of eight names, and one of them typically was Professor Jane Smith, um, they would put against her name F. But they wouldn't put anything against the men. And uh, <laughs> I came across a list, I can't remember where it was now, just very, very recently, and I pointed out, again, you are assuming that the women are the odd one out, and I don't like this. So we don't want male by default, and that applies in the research outcomes, like crash dummies, like how do heart attacks present. Um, there are real problems if you get this wrong. Um, so the US market has had to withdraw drugs because what was tested on a male population had terrible side effects on the women. Um, it's really important this is considered. And it's too easy not to do that if, as I say, you have a team of people who all look the same. And I would say, I'm not just saying this is because we need women in teams. If you had a team that was a dozen women and no men, it would probably come up with equally sort of biased thoughts about the world. And although I talk about women in physics, in Cambridge, 80% of our undergraduate vets are women. And you might just as well say, why are there no men studying to be vets? This is not a satisfactory state of affairs. So this gendering in our choices at school cuts both ways. Um, the number who, of boys who do English A-level is much smaller than the number of girls, for instance. And again, the Institute of Physics studied this and showed that schools which um, did not encourage girls to go on to study physics also did not encourage the boys to go on to study English or psychology. They were gendered in both directions. This isn't just a plea for special treatment for girls. It is that we need to treat everyone as individuals and not stereotype them. Um, I suspect, but I'm not well up in the other protected characteristics. I would imagine there are similar arguments, but I concentrate on gender because that's the one where I have um, studied more. So let me um, just uh, conclude this section with taking some quotes. Um, so the CBI website has considered this. And, and again, to go back to the productivity issue, they say, um, sorry, employers say they are more likely to innovate 
much more likely to innovate if they're in a sort of properly diverse and inclusive work environment. Um, the Harvard Business Review, I'm not going to read out the quotes, but you know they've studied this too. It is becoming clearer and clearer there is a real economic argument for diversity and inclusion. Um, and interestingly, this week, Helena Morrissey, who has been a champion for women in finance, um, has just headed up a new fund, which I think is legal in general, she works for now, um, which they're calling the Girl Fund, and saying they will only invest in companies which have moved to a properly diverse uh, and inclusive environment and have something like 30% of women on their boards and things like that. So. Um, the final example there is uh, from the National Center for Women in Information Technology. And again, they show that gender balanced companies perform better across the board, superior team dynamics and productivity. So if you just want to take an economic case, it is very easy to make. Now, you may think the moral case is good enough, Let's treat everyone the same. But if you're unconvinced by that argument, and I, I'm often surprised by the pushback I get by saying girls should do physics, um, if, if the sort of moral argument doesn't get anywhere, then we can take the economic argument and see if that shuts the critics up. And finally, th this was something the um, women's, oh, I think this was last year probably, uh, came up with this rather staggering figure um, of the amount of money the UK economy loses by keeping women out of um, STEM disciplines. A huge two billion, they said. I have no idea how they came up with that figure, but it's an impressive figure. So, as I say, I, I hate the fact that this stereotyping starts so young. And if you try and buy kids' clothes, um, if you can't read what it says on that rather pinkish leotard, it says, I hate my thighs. That's designed for a kid of 18 months or two years. Now, I mean, what kind of message is that for a young girl? I mean, what is the parent thinking of? Uh, it's really worrying, whereas you could easily find um, equivalent clothes that say, I'm super for the young boy. And so these messages start incredibly young. Um, I rather like the, uh, the one on the other side. Again, it's designed, you know, it's, you can see it's designed for a very small child. Girls can't do what with a picture of an astronaut. Again, the kid's not going to be able to read that, but it does say something about the attitude of the parent who, who buys that kind of baby grow rather than I hate my thighs. And I, I went on oh, Amazon or somewhere, um, yeah, it looks like Amazon, doesn't it, to see what kind of clothes you can buy. And I, I find it really hard to find an image that didn't say boys' clothes or girls' clothes. This one at least has, it has the toddler boys and uh, check shirt and shorts and the toddler infant girls pink dress. But the one in the middle is at least baby dungarees. So for once, they are not going to specify. And they will let a girl wear dungarees. And then there's the toys issue. If you look at toys advertisements, this was a Wordle I pulled off the web. And if you don't know how to read a Wordle, the size of the letters implies how frequently that word appears. So someone that studied a lot of toys adverts for four to eight year olds. And the most common word used in boys' toys was battle, and for girls, it was love. And then slightly lower down on the girls' side, we have magic and babies. Now, which is going to enable a young child to get on further in the world? I'm not in favor of battles myself. Um, heroes may be OK. Uh, beat, launch, they're all slightly iffy words, but I really don't think magic is the way to get on in this world. I'm sorry. I know this is the home of J.K. Rowling, but I really don't think magic is what a girl needs to get on. And we're giving them these messages. That's what they will see on television. So it is a concern. So let me um, move, if you like, back to the world of academia um, and continue this theme of gendering and think about how letters of reference are written. Now, why do women fall by the wayside? If you start off with philosophy, say, 50% men and women in the undergraduate population in Cambridge, certainly not 50% amongst the professoriate there, and I don't think here either. Uh, so why do they fall by the wayside? 
And think about the kind of words that people use. Male or assertive, women are aggressive. You ever come across that one? I certainly have. Uh, men are strong-minded, but women are feisty. Now, feisty isn't necessarily a bad word, but it's usually got a slight edge to it. Men are determined, and women are not a shrinking violet. A number of times I've been called not a shrinking violet, and I hate it. Uh, men are outstanding, and women are hardworking. Uh, men are leading lights, and women are team players. And perhaps, in some senses, even more pernicious, because it's quite hard to spot this one, men are judged on potential, and women are judged on accomplishments. And I have seen this happen in ways that really worried me. It was, um, I won't say where, but some men and women were being compared. It was in the area of medical engineering. And um, so having a patent was a good thing. And the men who had a patent, very good. And then there was a woman who had a patent, and the question was asked, well, has she made any money out of it? And someone, a man in the room, said, hang on a minute, that's not comparing like with like. And I must admit, I hadn't spotted that one, because they weren't, you know, the comments weren't sequential as we went through the list. But it's true. Men are judged on potential much oftener, but women have to have done it to prove themselves, which means it always takes that bit longer to be successful. So the quote I've got here is something I read in the newspaper from a senior Unilever manager. For example, a male manager looking to promote a man may say, chuck him in at the deep end and let's see if he sinks or swims. The same manager may say of a female candidate, is she ready yet? We don't want to set her up to fail. And I think that is actually a very common form of unconscious bias. Um, and it, it's probably one we've all been guilty of at some point. Um, and this uh, manager, a female manager, went on to say, words said with the best of intentions, without any malevolence, and arguably stated by a well-mannered man, man, but the impact on the progression of the two careers is clear. And I think that's right. This judging men on potential and women on accomplishments, I think happens subliminally quite often by men and by women. I don't think it's, you know, I think women are just as guilty of these sort of double things as men. Um, and it's very worrying. I think the issue of, of how people are described, the letters of reference issue has got much more recognized um, and people are more conscious of it. And there are websites you can look at, to, you know, you put in your letter of reference and, and they will tell you how, you know, whether you're using a lot of female words, as it were. Um, now, I would like to think things are changing. It's interesting, I wrote an article for the Times Higher Ed, and I was looking back at this recently. I wrote it in 2012, and it got absolutely no interest whatsoever. And I, I wrote another article about letters of reference uh, on my own blog, which the Times Higher picked up. Uh, this was in 2016, and the Times Higher is still retweeting this. It still gets interest. And I think that probably shows that this kind of message is entering consciousness, that people are much more aware. But let me give you a couple of examples. These were letters of reference for a promotion in my university. So the woman had a consistent output of more than a dozen papers per year, um, this was in the sciences, despite a period of maternity leave and currently working less than full time, more than two million pounds of current research field funding as a lead PI. She's still at a relatively early stage of her career and this makes me uncomfortable about recommending her. And this was by a nominated referee. This was allegedly a friend of this woman. Whereas a, a, a different referee, admittedly, wrote about a man, I should comment on the fact that all but three of B's recent publications do, do not, uh, all, all but three do not include his, his um, mentor. So most of his papers were with his mentor as a co-author or his, his supervisor. However, about half of these, B appears to be the senior author and presumably the intellectual driving force behind the work. My overall view is that he is highly deserving. And so the referee for male B uh, was making all kinds of judgments, which the evidence didn't particularly give an answer to one way or the other. I don't know how he thought he knew. Um, in this case, the committee um, looked at these references and decided that both candidates were equally deserving and both got promoted. But I feel the tone, you know, seeing those, and I think these, in this case, these two letters did come sort of sequentially. It was very obvious that I, I was naughty enough to copy them down because I was so struck by this comparison. The man was being given the benefit of the doubt, the woman was not. It cuts both ways, and it isn't just men doing down women. <laughs> women are as stereotypical as the men. 
So um, this next quote came from an article that Christina O'Donnell wrote in The Telegraph, um, ab objecting to the fact her 14-year-old daughter, this was in England, not Scotland, her 14-year-old daughter had to keep on studying science. And she said, this focus on STEM subjects sends a message subjects, her and me, uncomfortable. Doing a man's work is more impressive than doing a woman's. So automatically assuming that STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and maths are men's subjects and that a woman should not do it, and implying that studying the art subjects is not men's work. And I think some male authors and poets might find that quite strange. And I mean, the reason I stress this in England is I know that the Scottish system gives you a chance to stay broader for longer. The A-level system, which is what I'm sorry, I've been talking about heavily, is peculiar to England and Wales, and um, peculiar in all senses of the word. Um, and unhelpful, I would say. But Christina O'Donnell is just propagating this idea that men do science and women do arts. No, it's not like that. Um, and we should all try and keep broad. This takes me to the scholars versus scientists. Um, I, I mentioned the Stefan Collini interaction at the start. Why can't we mix and match? Why do I have to choose at, in England, 14 and say, I'm going to do this track, not that track. Um, and it comes back to these disciplinary silos that I think are so pernicious. Um, we don't really have a good word for this. I mean, the Germans call knowledge Wissenschaft, and I think that encompasses natural sciences. And of course, here, physics is called natural philosophy. Um, but too often, we have science and arts, these polarized differences. Um, now, I'm expected to know Shakespeare, but arts people can often get away with saying, I never could do maths. And I find that quite a disturbing juxtaposition too. If I said I've never read a Shakespeare play, people would say, oh, you're really not very cultured, are you? But you look at the politicians who say, well, I can't do maths and probably can't. Um, and it's quite worrying. Now, C.P. Snow uh, was the one who said it was a, a sort of sin not to know the second law of thermodynamics. I don't quite um, subscribe to that view. I don't think it matters if you can't quote the second law of thermodynamics if you're you know, studying some other subject. I do think it's a problem if you don't realize that there is such a law and it tells you you can't have a perpetual motion machine. Um, and at least that you can grasp the concept that such a law exists. Um, I don't think it's a case of knowing facts. I think it's a case of understanding concepts, which is more important. And I mentioned politicians, and I think the fact, never mind the fact they're all Oxford graduates who've done PPE, leaving that aside, I think the fact that they, again, are all coming from a rather narrow range of disciplines and really don't understand uh, science terribly well means they can make some very foolish decisions uh, when the science really matters. Now, C.P. Snow was, of course, not the first to get embroiled in these kind of controversies. Um, so if you go back to uh, Thomas Huxley and Matthew Arnold back in the 1880s, um, they were really having, in a more gentlemanly way than C.P. Snow and Levis had, uh, they were having rather the same argument. Um, and these are two, again, um, I can't remember which the Huxley lecture was. Um, it was, it was a named lecture, and Matthew Arnold rebutted it a few years later. And this was at a time when science was really getting established as a thing, and scientist was being used as a word. Um, and Huxley was talking about education. He was very concerned about education, was involved with the foundation of Imperial College. From the time that first the first suggestion to introduce physical science into ordinary, ordinary education was timidly whispered, until now, the advocate of scientific education have met with opposition of two kinds. On the one hand, they've been poo-pooed by the men of business who pride themselves of being the representative of pract practicality, while on the other hand, they've been excommunicated by the classical scholars in their capacity of Levites in charge of the arc of culture and monopolists of liberal education. And Matthew Arnold undoubtedly believed that classical education was what you needed, and that was the, um, what was the phrase, the best that man can read and think. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the precise quote. But Matthew Arnold gave some ground and, and said, uh, we all have to acquaint ourselves with the great, great results reached by modern science. Don't think a politician would say that now. And to give ourselves as much training in its disciplines as we can conveniently carry, well, that might not be very much, um, yet the majority of men, men, will always require humane letters and, as, and so much the more as they have the more and greater results of science to relate to the need in man for conduct 
and to need in him for beauty. He was a great believer in, in beauty and elegance, um, relying on the classical cultures. But he concluded there's really no difference between Professor Huxley and me as to whether knowing the great results of the modern scientific study of nature is not required as a part of our culture, as well as knowing the products of literary and art. So he grudgingly says, yeah, knowing a bit of science is probably a good idea, but really you should be studying classics. Um, so this argument goes back a long, long way. Um, if you go further back, we really didn't have this distinction. Um, Erasmus Darwin is a fascinating polymath in that he was a physician. That was his day job. But he, um, so he, he was Charles Darwin's grandfather. And he did sort of hint at uh, evolution in what he wrote. He wrote a, 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 a poetry I find quite unreadable, but he wrote something called The Loves of the Plants, which was trying to um, introduce Linnaean classification to the general public. Um, this was actually a quote on ballooning. But you know, he very much, um, he was sort of the leading poet of his day, um, as well as being a physician by day and was asked to be the royal physician, though he chose not to do that because he didn't want to leave the Midlands. So at that point, so this is uh, that quote, 1789, um, at that point, it was perfectly possible to be a polymath, to do a bit of this and a bit of that. And of course, Erasmus Darwin was very much involved with the, the Lunar Society. Wordsworth, it's like, you know, a few years later, also wrote about ballooning. And also, you know, the, the Romantic poets at that point were still perfectly comfortable, um, Coleridge too, getting involved with science and arts. Didn't see a distinction. Um, but it was around the turn of the century, the, the, around 1800, that attitudes began to change. And this polarization came into being. So William Blake um, put on the engraving of Laocan, which is... Um, Sorry, that <laughs> engraving there. Art is the tree of life, science is the tree of death, which is a pretty damning kind of con comment. Uh, Thomas Carlyle, likewise, the progress of science is to destroy wonder and in its stead substitute mensuration and numeration. And going later still, Nietzsche um, uh, was even more negative. It, well, Nietzsche was usually negative, wasn't he? Um, it's not a question of annihilating science, but of controlling it. The science is totally dependent upon philosophical opinions for all to its goals and methods, though it easily forgets this. And I think we could have an hour-long debate on that quote, but now is not the moment. Um, so things changed around 1800, and we got into this polarization, which takes us to the Huxley, Arnold, and ultimately Snow and Levis, and where we are today. And one can ask, why is there this division? If you go back to the Victorians, I think class has quite a lot to do with it. Um, that scientists were typically doing things with their hands. This was manual, artisanal work, and not for gentlemen. So I think class came into it. Um, if you think about the medical profession, at that point, they'd have distinguished between a surgeon, sawbones, and a medical doctor. The latter was a gentleman. The, the surgeon was not. Um, and um, there were scholars, to go back to the Stefan Collini phrase, versus projectors, which was the phrase used around 1800 for people who did something useful. Um, and being a projector was regarded um, with even more disdain, I think, than being having impact now is. So that's saying quite a lot. Um, so this idea that scientists are a race apart, possibly a, close, a class apart, has been around for a long time. But that Blake quote, and indeed many other quotes, suggest that science is not creative and that it's only the arts people who are creative. And again, I think that's something that should be totally rejected. Um, so Carlyle, remember, said the progress of science is to destroy wonder and it, in its stead substitute mensuration and numeration. If we go somewhat more recently to the 30s, a fellow of King's College in Cambridge said, when science arrives, it expels literature. And uh, this quote um, by a modern novelist particularly upsets me. The purpose of artists is to ask the right questions, even if we don't find the answers, whereas the aim of science is to prove some dumb point. And I just wonder how much science has transformed her life from her smartphone to, to curing her health problems. I just find that remark so appalling. It really upsets me. But the idea is that science is not creative, which is complete bunkum, as anyone who's ever done a science experiment knows. So Peter Medewer, um, a Nobel Prize winner and immunologist, um, writes beautifully, well, wrote beautifully, he's been dead a while, um, and um, 
I think expresses it very well. He said, all ideas of scientific understanding at every level begin with a speculative adventure, an imaginative preconception of what might be true, a preconception that always and necessarily goes a little way, sometimes a long way, beyond anything which we have logical or factual authority to believe in. And if you read about his discoveries, you see exactly how that came about. He, he sort of changed the way we think about immunology. And I think for every scientist, the art of experimentation, and it often is an art, is constantly to, to rethink the questions you're asking and where you're going. If you are just trying to prove a dumb point, then it probably means you're doing an undergraduate physics practical, in my view. <laughs> Our first practical in Cambridge is measuring little g. And measuring little g has been done um, millions and millions of times, and I cannot believe it's the best way to inspire our, our incoming physicists. But you need to learn how to do it before you can do something more interesting. Then, of course, there are those people who sit between disciplines. I mean, there are polymaths, someone like Erasmus Darwin, um, Thomas Young, who did a, a lot on vision and um, the wave theory of light, uh, the biography biography of him I read recently was called um, uh, something like The Last Man Who Knew Everything. Probably a slight overstatement, but he was a, a very general kind of polymath, as was Erasmus Darwin. And I'm tr I was trying to think of some modern examples. Jonathan Miller comes to mind, who was a medic, but also a playwright. It's not easy to do it now, because there is so much stuff one has to know. But on the other hand, pigeonholing people, this idea of sticking you in a silo and saying you're not allowed out of that is immensely dangerous. Now, UKRI, um, the new super research council that will sit over the seven research councils, claims it's going to manage to do interdisciplinary work better. Um, if you've read the UKRI strategy document, um, it is mentioned in there. If you haven't read it, I wouldn't bother because it's really a lot of fluff about how they're going to develop a strategy. But it was just released this week, so uh, you might want to read it. Um, they claim they're going to make interdisciplinary stuff work better. I am waiting to see the proof of that pudding. I'm also going to see them later this month to try and pin them down and say, what are you going to do? Um, because um, if they can't get it right, if we don't have, if the structure of a super research council, which should sit above any disciplinary boundaries, if they can't get it right, we're really in trouble. Um, okay, I mentioned the fact that I'm chairing the interdisciplinary advisory panel um, for the REF. So the um, criteria we're suggesting are being consulted on at the moment, uh, trying to make sure that interdisciplinary output and judged fairly and encouraged to be submitted. Because in the last ref, it was very clear that people were frightened about putting in interdisciplinary outputs because they worried they would not get a fair hearing. So uh, people who analyzed the um, outcomes of the last ref said there was no indication that interdisciplinary work was penalized by the panels, but it was quite clear that the number of um, submissions that would class themselves as interdisciplinary was far lower than would be expected on what's going on in the universities. So there is a problem there. And I think it is also a problem when it comes to things like appointment and promotion processes. There's always the case, you know, are you going to fit into our department? Are you going to be able to teach the core courses? And if you're genuinely interdisciplinary, you may find you have problems. I think it's true at research funding grant panels and all these places. If you cross disciplines, you are in trouble sometimes. Not always, and sometimes it can be a real strength, but too often I think there are um, sort of hurdles that other people don't have. But if we think about what the big challenges are now, they're not going to be solved by people sitting in a little silo. So take something like climate change. How many different disciplines do you need to address that problem? Um, renewable energy. Nuclear power. I mean, it's not just about can you make, can you get nuclear power out of a power station? It's where are you going to site it? How are you going to convince people it's safe? What are you going to do with disposing of the waste? All these things. Nanoparticles. All these challenges um, require not just the science, but you need to have people who understand risk. You need to understand how people are going to respond. To, to different things. You need to talk about intergenerational justice. You need to talk about ethics. A whole range of different things are going to be required if we're going to solve climate change. Um, obesity and diet is another key 
challenge for us. Um, we may all know we should eat five fruit a day, we should, or fruit, fruit and veg, we should take more exercise, all the rest of it, but how are you going to persuade people to do it? The Department of Health has been telling people this five a day uh, for years. And um, I'm sorry to say my understanding is Scotland is worse than England on this one. The, the fruit and veg are slightly um, a dirty word. I'm married to a Scot, so I might like to say that. I know what his attitude is to fruit. Um, <laughs> mental health, he was brought up in Glasgow, it's all right. Um, <laughs> mental health, um, it's not just about the underlying neuroscience, it's about so much more about how to have successful interventions. And mental health on campus is you know, a hot topic at the moment. I, for a while, served as chair of the Scientific Advisory Council for the Department of Culture, Music, Music and Sports, and we had some very interesting discussions about if you go to a, a museum or to a park, what does that do for your mental health? And because so much of the scientific civil service is full of economists. It was all about, well, what's the value? You know, how do we quantify running a museum versus the fact that these people might feel better and not need mental health interventions? So you know, what, what's the uh, cost-benefit analysis? And I can't think of it quite like that, but um, I do think there are many challenges which are not just about the underlying science. And in all these problems, sitting in your discipline, never speaking to anyone else, isn't going to get you very far. And that is also true of our policymakers. Um, you need people who have diverse backgrounds in order to make sensible policy decisions. So uh, DCMS, as I say, it did seem to be populated by economists. Um, I think the economists were thought to be quantitative, which of course they are, but it is a certain way of looking at things. So they had one physicist that I knew about. Um, I don't. Know, I think they had some linguists. I have no idea if they had any philosophers. Um, but you need to have people approaching problems about our society from all different directions. Uh, politicians are sadly lacking in science backgrounds. Um, but scientists also need to talk to policymakers. In Cambridge, uh, there's a new Institute for Public Policy which has just been launched. Churchill is working very closely with them. Churchill being full of scientists. I want to get the scientists understanding that they need to think about policy um, and that there is uh, there should be a meeting of minds, shall we say. And so we set up a project um, also involving the Centre for Science and Policy um, called Science and Democracy. Initially, the guy from the, the uh, Institute of Public Policy wanted to call it Science and the Future of Democracy, but decided that sounded a bit too grandiose. So we've cut it back. It's just Science and Democracy. So let me conclude um, by saying I really think diversity matters. It matters in the context of gender. I'm sure it matters in the case of the other protected characteristics, which I don't feel com competent to talk about. It matters in the context of discipline. And yet, we are constantly being put into these bins. You know, what are you? Where do you fit into my simple way of looking at the world with these binary divides? Um, and I think all of us need to work better at not pigeonholing people. Um, and if we did that, we'd all be better off and better able to solve the problems of the world, as it were. But culture change is always, always difficult. So it's not going to be easy to change things that have been established for many years. Thank you.